Uh, is Kayla? So today it gives me great pleasure to introduce Ms. Kayla Long, who um, got her bachelor's degree from Swarthmore College in 2016. She did a short stint and successful stint as a research specialist. Um, then we were very fortunate to recruit her to the neuroscience program at the University of Pennsylvania, um, after um, which she joined um, the laboratory of um, Dr. Judy Grinspan and myself um, and started working on this longstanding collaboration that we have looking at the effects of both HIV infection and the antiretroviral drugs um, on the white matter within the brain. And Kayla really brought this um, interest specifically focusing on, on the um, PrEP exposure that she's gonna tell you about the work today where we're out really looking at how PrEP might be affecting people who are taking antiretroviral drugs in that prophylactic way to prevent um, HIV infection and hopefully with some cons special considerations specifically for the adolescent population. So turn it over to you, Kayla. Sounds good. Thank you, Kelly. All right, sharing. I'm going to see if I can <clears throat> hide my toolbar real quick. I know it's over here somewhere. There we go. Okay, cool. Great. Yeah, so as Kelly said, I'm particularly interested in pre-exposure prophylaxis and its effects on oligodendrocyte differentiation. And I presented here, I think two years ago at this point. Um, so I'm excited to share some exciting data this year, focusing on a potential rescue um, or prevention with acidic nanoparticles and their ability to allow oligodendrocytes to differentiate even in the context of PrEP. Oops. So first, as we know, HIV infects a lot of people still around the world. Um, and what happens is it infects CD4 positive cells and results in a weakened immune system. And we really can't emphasize enough just how great antiretroviral therapy has been since its advent in about the mid 90s. Um, and it works by decreasing viral plasma load or plasma viral load. Um, increasing CD4 positive cell count, allowing the immune system recovery, overall resulting in an increased lifespan. And there's a quick little illustration over here. Uh, you'll see first in red HIV AIDS death, and then on the x-axis is the year, and then you'll see blue come in, and those are the lives saved with the advent of art. I just find it really powerful. Uh, so it's going to play twice, and it's a little quick. Um, but here it is. So you can see over time, greatly decreasing the number of deaths, and then overall resulting in an increase in the number of deaths averted um, with the advent of ART. So ART typically was used to prolong the lifespan in HIV or individuals with HIV, uh, but it also has the use of preventing the acquisition of HIV in the first place or PrEP. So. Uh, Pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is PrEP, uh, prevents HIV acquisition, and there are multiple dosing strategies and forms, but um, HIV negative, and there are different times um, before exposure to HIV, um, and then, you know, allows the individual to remain HIV negative. Uh, the dosing strategies can look like uh, once daily, so an individual will take that daily long term. Um, it's also recently been used more off-label as on-demand or uh, two pills taken greater or about 24 hours before an exposure, uh, one taken 24 hours after the first dose, and then another taken 24 hours after the second dose. And then uh, moving also towards long-lasting injectables as, uh, you know, for a number of different circumstances, taking a medication daily can be challenging, um, and these injections look more like a once a month. Uh, treatment. So each has, you know, different benefits and drawbacks, but what I'm focusing on um, is the once daily dosing of PrEP as originally when I started this project, that was the only method approved uh, by the FDA. So a little bit about the antiretrovirals that make up PrEP. So PrEP or the art drugs um, themselves can target different aspects of replication, but specifically 
PrEP uh, prevents HIV replication by inhibiting reverse transcriptase, and that prevents uh, the HIV from ever being incorporated into the cell's genome. So they're in the family called nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and the two particular drugs that I'm interested in are emtricitabine, also known as FTC, and tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, known as TDF. And again, can't emphasize enough how great um, antiretrovirals themselves have been and PrEP specifically, but looking back um, at some data from HIV positive individuals on ART, we've been able to learn some things potentially about these antiretroviral drugs. Uh, so on the right, I'm just showing you a human brain and in green is the corpus callosum. So this is made up of white matter uh, when I talk about white matter and this is sagittal or if it was sectioned down the middle of the brain. These images down here in gray are from uh, MRIs and this top one is a control and then the bottom uh, is of somebody who's HIV positive and uh, has been on antiretroviral. So all of that taken together uh, the study demonstrates that there's a thinning of the corpus callosum in these individuals. Furthermore, not only was it thinner, but the duration of art actually correlated to the degree of the thinning or myelin loss. And even in the context of art where we have viral su suppression, transcripts critical to myelination remain dysregulated while on antiretroviral therapies. So this raises a few questions uh, for the Grinspan and Jordan Shooter Lab, particularly. Uh, is it, you know, a viral reservoir that's resulting in these changes? Or um, what we're particularly interested in is it's possible that it's the antiretroviral drugs themselves. So let me tell you a little bit more about the oligodendrocytes before I get into um, some of the research that we've done. So oligodendrocytes perform multiple functions in the CNS. Uh, they typically used to be thought of just needed to insulate the axon in a very axon-centric um, manner. But myelination is actually dynamic, and the oligodendrocytes will myelinate throughout the life. Uh, they actually play a critical role in the node formations. They're not just you know these bystanders. They play a role in neurotransmission, and then also metabolic support. So they're not just this insulation that allows action potentials to go faster, but they actually, through uh, different channels, are able to give nutrients to the axon itself. And something that's really important to emphasize from my talk today is that myelination continues through adolescence and into adulthood. So myelination is largely a postnatal event. You have this steep increase during infancy and childhood. Then you have a second wave uh, during adolescence and then continues into adulthood where you might have some more dynamic uh, in turnover of myelin in a experience dependent manner. So taken together, this really leads to the overall hypothesis that PrEP, made up of FTC and TDF, could inhibit myelination in adolescents. And as I just showed you, um, you know, adolescents are particularly vulnerable to a myelin insult as there's this uh, wave of myelination. And adolescents also uh, disproportionately still make up the number of new HIV positive cases. So um, each year. So this is really important that this group, you know, is focused on and also that they're taking PrEP. So first, uh, the question we had was, um, if we're giving this to uh, animals, in this case rats, uh, is it, what effect does it have on its myelination? So here I've just outlined the time frame that coordinates or corresponds to um, adolescents and rodents. So from three to six weeks old, uh, rats were orally gavaged with the two drugs uh, that compose PrEP. Um, and then at six weeks old, we were able to examine the brains and see what effects, if any, were um, happening on myelination. I just wanted to give you some markers so that you're familiar when I show you the data. So oligodendrocyte differentiation can be measured uh, with really state-specific lineage markers in vivo. So the precursor cells uh, will be NG2 positive, and these are before they differentiate into an 
immature oligodendrocyte. And then finally, it's these mature oligodendrocytes that are really capable of producing myelin. And they will be represented with PLP or ASPA. Here are just some example images of what they'll look like. You'll notice ASPA on the right uh, stains cell bodies and PLP stains the processes. So they give two very nice ways to uh, look at myelination in the animals. So PrEP treatment significantly inhibited oligodendrocyte maturation in the cortex of adolescent rats. On the right, I just have a sagittal brain section of the rats. So uh, in yellow is the corpus callosum, and then in the front um, is the area where I was you know, taking these images from, and each are represented in boxes, uh, just so you're familiar uh, with the parts of the brain. And something important during this time frame, since myelination is still occurring, is that myelination proceeds from caudal to rostral in the brain. So in the front, in this cortex, this area is still going to be undergoing myelination in these animals. So first, um, in the untreated group, you can see PLP staining. Uh, so that's that mature protein that's found in uh, the projections of these oligos. Uh, and then vehicle and then uh, animals that were treated with PrEP. And here on the top is PLP, uh, the corrected total cellular fluorescence in vehicle versus PrEP treated animals for PLP. And then also again, still in the cortex, uh, the total area of PLP in vehicle versus PrEP. And we see that both are significantly decreased uh, when given PrEP. And we can look at ASPA also, so as I, Mentioned ASPA is uh, another mature oligodendrocyte marker, but it stains more the cell body. So this allows us to be able to count the number of immature oligodendrocytes. And then oh, there it is, ASPA. So there's a significant decrease in the number of PLP or of ASPA positive cells in the cortex of animals treated with PrEP. And then we can also look at NG2, which was our precursor, so the oligodendro or the OPCs that do not differentiate into oligodendrocytes. Nope. Uh, sorry, that graph <laughs> didn't show up. But um, there was no change, but I'm not sure where that one went. OK, so <laughs> next we can look at the corpus callosum. So PrEP treatment significantly inhibits oligodendrocyte uh, maturation in the cortex, but we wanted to know, does it also inhibit in the corpus callosum? So again, looking at PrEP, uh, total cellular fluorescence um, with PLP, there's no significant difference. Uh, there's also no significant difference of PLP between vehicle and PrEP treated animals. Um, and then for ASPA, uh, there were significantly fewer number of mature oligodendrocytes found within the corpus callosum of PrEP-treated animals compared to vehicle-treated. So in summary of the initial in vivo data, we saw that PrEP inhibits oligodendrocyte maturation in adolescent rats, so if they were given PrEP by oral gavage, and then we looked in the cortex, uh, we can see that in uh, purple are oligodendrocytes, and uh, in green are OPCs. So this led us to the next question um, that we wanted to use our in vitro cell model uh, to be able to answer a question as to if PrEP inhibits oligodendrocyte maturation, um, and is this an actual inhibition of oligodendrocyte maturation that's independent of cell death, or does it are we seeing less myelination due to cell death? So in vitro, um, our markers are a little different. So again, the oligodendrocyte precursor cell that's not differentiated will be marked with A2B5. Um, and here's a, a just an image uh, from the microscope of what they'll look like. Then we have an immature oligodendrocyte marker called Gal-C, demonstrated in green. And then finally, our mature oligodendrocyte marker, PLP again in red, which you saw earlier, also in vivo. Um, and then Gaussi in green. And Gaussi remains on uh, from the immature to mature, so you might see some yellow cells also. 
And again, it's important to note that it's these mature oligodendrocytes that if they were in vivo would be the only cells uh, capable of producing myelin. Our in vitro assay looks a little bit like this. So in order to examine oligodendrocyte maturation, we actually harvest OPCs or the precursor cells from raparanes. And through different steps, we're able to actually just take advantage of their adherence properties um, and use a method called a shake-off such that only the OPCs remain behind and we have about 90% pure OPCs. And then we're able to do our assays um, on OPCs and we're able to give them uh, differentiation media and can differentiate them into mature oligodendrocytes um, in vitro. So looking a little bit more at the methods, um, so these cells, the OPCs in this blue pro proliferation will be given uh, prep at the same time that they're differentiated. So during this differentiation period of 72 hours, these cells will receive prep, and then they would be assayed at the end of the 72 hours. And the way we chose our concentrations, uh, so the medium dose that you'll be seeing is corresponds to the plasma Cmax of the drugs in humans on prep. Uh, that we also did a three times dose and uh, one tenth dose. And you'll see on any graphs that I show that it's normalized to untreated. So that represents like this dotted line at 100. And then each of the dots represents a different biological replicate. So looking at the data, uh, we saw that PrEP treatment, in fact, did significantly reduce oligodendrocyte maturation and that this was independent of cell death. So let me walk you through this data. In green, you'll see our immature marker of GALC. Red, our mature marker um, PLP, and then DAPI just for the nuclei, nuclei. And we see that there's a significant decrease in both these immature cells and mature cells uh, when they're treated with PrEP. But that alone is not enough to conclude that it's independent of cell death. So we also wanted to look at AGB5, our oligodendrocyte precursor marker, so the cells that have not differentiated into oligodendrocytes. Um, and if we took a look at that, there were no significant changes between treatment groups um, with PrEP. We can also uh, wanted to look at cell death itself. So JAK7 uh, is a cell impermeable, di permeable dye um, that will only go into cells that are dead or dying. And we saw that um, looking at cell viability, there were no significant changes uh, with PrEP treatment. And we can also look at myelin proteins. Um, so to complement the IHC, we did aminoblots to look at MBP or a mature myelin protein. And we also looked at PLP, which is another mature myelin protein. Here on the left, MBP is significantly decreased uh, when PrEP is given. However, if we look on the right, PLP, that other mature myelin protein, does not change. And this raised a few questions, which I'll touch back on a little bit later. Um, but one of the things to note is that MBP is locally translated at the plasma membrane of oligodendrocytes in a need-dependent manner, uh, whereas PLP is transported as a, a synthesized protein um, through the lysosomes in oligodendrocytes. So this led us to the next question that we wanted to answer in vitro, and that's how does PrEP inhibit oligodendrocyte maturation? And we we're able to take a few um, like indications just based on the basic nature of the drugs, the fact that they are weak bases themselves. And also uh, one of our collaborators, Jonathan Geiger, uh, noticed that these drugs uh, deacidify uh, endolysosomes within neurons. So a little bit about the lysosome. So lysosomes are acidic, single uh, membrane bound organelles. And it's really important that they're acidic for all of their different proteases to remain functional. So uh, some of the main roles of the lysosome is that they participate in recycling macromolecules and degrading them. So they can do this either intracellularly through autophagy or extracellularly through endocytosis. And there are many channels that play a role um, in maintaining the pH of the lysosome. So we first just looked at our cultures and wanted to see 
what's happening to the lysosomes uh, and we could use LAMP1 as a marker. And we saw that there's a decrease in the number of LAMP1 positive vesicles from untreated uh, to PrEP high. And then also we saw that there were significantly fewer functional lysosomes. Um, and the way that we could determine function was using this assay called DQBSA in which the DQBSA exists in a self-quenching formation. And it's only once it enters a proteolytically active environment that it is cleaved and can fluoresce. So here we see that there's significantly fewer um, lysosomes and they have less proteolytic function. Furthermore, to complement that, we uh, could use something called lysotracker, which is quantitated over here on the right, and saw that there are significantly fewer acidic lysosomes when treated with PrEP. And then finally, uh, all this is you know great in helping us assess the acidity and function of the lysosomes, but we wanted to actually uh, quantitate the pH. So we were able to use lysosensor um, and determine that when PrEP is given to oligodendrocytes that they have a significantly higher pH or are deacidified de compared to the untreated or vehicle groups. So we see that PrEP inhibits oligodendrocyte maturation and that this is through uh, the lysosomes. So it's increasing the pH resulting in decreased lysosome function. But the next question that we wanted to ask is how is this happening? So like, um, why are is lysosome deacidification inhibiting oligodendrocyte maturation? Um, so our question was uh, that we wanted to investigate was if PrEP deacidified lysosomes uh, accumulate myelin proteins in vitro. And we asked this question as we can see that PrEP deacidifies the lysosomes outside the working range of cathepsin D. So cathepsin D is a protease found within the lysosome uh, whose activity is greatest at a pH or below a pH of five. In previous work by another group has demonstrated that uh, cathepsin D deficiency delays central nervous system myelination, and that this is actually through by inhibiting uh, proteolipid protein trafficking from the lysosome to the plasma membrane. Um, and here, kind of similar to what I showed you earlier, there's no change in the whole cell levels. This is a blot for PLP. But when they assess just the membrane uh, PLP, they saw that there's significantly less when you're losing this cathepsin D that's critical within the lysosomes, um, and then that the cytoplasmic levels have not changed. And here's just a reminder um, of what I saw. So I saw a change in MVP levels, so a mature uh, oligodendrocyte protein, but no changes within PLP by Western blot. And they have different routes um, with PLP going through the lysosome, so really suggesting that it's possible that myelin proteins are accumulating within the lysosomes. So in order to do this, um, I did a biotinylation assay such that all of the proteins on unliced oligodendrocytes were labeled with biotin. Then the cells were lysed, and I collected total protein and kept a small amount of that to have uh, to be able to run on the blot itself. Then um, I used a column that would accumulate or have all of the proteins that had biotin attached to them would attach to the column. And then those would be the surface proteins. And then the internal proteins that were not biotinylated would go through the column. So I'd have an internal protein sample. Then I was able to elute biotinylated proteins. And then I'd have a sample that had all of the cell surface proteins. Then I could do Western blot with an antibody to PLP and run, the, uh, down here is just an example graph, but run uh, total surface and internal all on the same graph um, and have a representation of total PLP, surface, and internal. So looking at that, on the left is an example blot where the first group um, are untreated vehicle, then prep low, medium, and high. And then the next group in purple are the internal uh, samples I had. 
And then the final group are the surface um, samples. So when probed for PLP, you can see, again, that there's no change in total level of PLP. But when we look specifically at surface PLP, there is significantly less, um, well, it's only an N of two, so I can't say that. But it appears by eye that there are less, there's less uh, PLP. So this led us to um, another question in vitro as to can we give something to the lysosomes that acidifies them at the same time as PrEP treatment? And is this sufficient to allow myelination to occur? So we used something called acidic nanoparticles. Um, so they're made up of PLGA. So it's actually great. It's already FDA approved. Um, and it's usually used to deliver a drug, but here we just use the actual uh, PLGA itself as it's one specifically targeted to the lysosome, which historically um, has been not great because uh, people weren't able to get drugs delivered to the cells of interest, but for us, it's really great. We want them to go to the lysosome. And then once they enter the lysosome, just through um, hydrolysis uh, that's broken into two acidic components and able to acidify lysosome environment. So we first did a control. Um, baflomycin A is known to inhibit VATPase pump on lysosomes. So this just serves as a control um, in our oligodendrocytes. If we, uh, in the upper right, oops, sorry, bottom left, <laughs> my labels are wrong. So I'm just going to walk you through this. Uh, the top left are untreated cells. This bottom left are cells that were treated with 500 picomolar of baflomycin. Uh, the top right are untreated cells that were given the acidic nanoparticles that have a green label. Um, and then the bottom uh, were given baflomycin and the acidic nanoparticles. Sorry about that. Um, and in our control, we saw that we are able to significantly uh, rescue oligodendrocyte maturation as determined by Gaussi positive cells when uh, the cells were treated with baflomycin or an agent that deacidifies them and the acidic nanoparticles. So this just served as a control that they work within oligodendrocytes um, and do what we think they're doing. And then in red, uh, that's lyso tracker again, and that's a marker for acidic lysosomes. And you can see that. Uh, these acidic nanoparticles are in fact uh, co-localizing uh, with the lysosome. So looking at PrEP though, uh, we found that acidic nanoparticles do in fact uh, prevent PrEP-induced inhibition of oligodendrocyte maturation in vitro. So this top row um, does not have acidic nanoparticles. The bottom row does have acidic nanoparticles. We're using the same immature marker uh, that I introduced earlier in green, Gaussi. In red is PLP, the mature oligodendrocyte marker, and then the nuclei are in blue again. So first, if we just look at the top row, we see that there's a significant decrease in the number of Gaussi and PLP positive oligodendrocytes, as we saw previously. Then when we treat at the same time with the acidic nanoparticles, uh, we see a rest or uh, that the acidic nanoparticles prevent PrEP from inhibiting oligodendrocyte maturation. This is quantitated down here uh, on the left, Gaussi, and then on the right, PLP. And then here's just a magnified image uh, really showing that the acidic nanoparticles do in fact co-localize with lysotracker. Furthermore, uh, we wanted to again look at what effects uh, the acidic nanoparticles are having on these lysosomes. So on the left, uh, PLP, our mature uh, myelin protein. In green, LAMP1, representing late endosomes and lysosomes, our nuclei in blue. And we have a significant decrease with PrEP alone, so the top row. And then when we add the acidic nanoparticles at the same time, uh, there's a rescue in PrEP low uh, with the acidic nanoparticles for the total number of LAMP1 positive vesicles. We also use DQBSA, which I mentioned before, that um, 
only fluoresces in a proteolytically active environment. Um, it's only NF2, so we can't conclude anything statistically yet, but saw that uh, there seems to be significantly more proteolytic activity of cells that were treated with acidic nanoparticles, so the green bars, uh, compared to cells that uh, received PrEP but no acidic nanoparticles. So this is all great that we were able to do this in vitro, but really coming back full circle to the data I showed at the beginning, we wanted to know, can we do this in vivo? And is it sufficient to um, allow myelination to occur in the context of PrEP? Just gonna walk you through the methods for this in vivo study. Uh, so we're in the same age animal. So this three to six week old adolescent period of rats, um, the animals are still receiving oral gavage of either PrEP or the vehicle of 5% DMSO. But this time, the animals are receiving either the acidic nanoparticles that were used in vitro, uh, and they're receiving them intranasally. Uh, so just uh, quite literally through the nose with a pipette tip, and they're able to work their way through uh, the nasal like epithelium in between cells and enter the brain. And we did this method as the acidic nanoparticles uh, do not cross the blood-brain barrier. And uh, we had a group that received the acidic nanoparticles or a group that served as a control and only received PBS. As a reminder, myelination you know, proceeds from the back of the brain or caudal to the front of the brain rostral. So looking at uh, the effects, we're first going to look in the cortex like last time. Uh, so looking up here in, in the front of the brain, and in green, PLP, our mature myelin protein, um, and we can see in untreated, then when the animals are treated with PrEP, there's a significant decrease represented over here by this white bar. And then when we give the acidic nanoparticles, uh, there's actually a recovery of uh, PLP or myelination uh, oligodendrocyte maturation in the cortex. When we do ASPA, so ASPA is another mature oligodendrocyte marker, but it stains the cell bodies, allowing us to do counts rather than their total fluorescent like we had to do for PLP. Uh, we saw that there was a significant decrease in the number of ASPA positive cells in PrEP treatment compared to untreated, and that there is a significant increase in animals that received both the acidic nanoparticles and PrEP compared to animals that received only PrEP alone. Again, we wanted to look at the corpus callosum. As we saw that there were effects in the cortex, um, we wanted to know if are there also effects in the corpus callosum. So the corpus callosum is the part that is stained heavily with green and can be represented uh, over here by yellow. So PL, again, we're looking at PLP, but this time uh, we do not see any significant changes um, in the corpus callosum of PLP for the total cellular fluorescence. We also, again, wanted to look at ASPA positive and look at the number of cell bodies. And here we saw that there was a significant decrease um, in PrEP alone treatment. So this middle group here of ASPA uh, total cells. Um, and then there was a trend towards an increase um, in the number of ASPA positive cells in the corpus callosum, um, but it was not significantly different. So taking all of this together, um, we see that the acidic nanoparticles do in fact uh, prevent PrEP-induced inhibition of oligodendrocyte maturation, um, but really we only see this effect in the cortex. Um, so if we look at our sagittal view over here again, there are a few potential reasons for this, and uh, those include that myelination starts in the back of the brain and uh, proceeds to the front. So these adolescent animals would be undergoing the highest rate of myelination in um, the cortex towards the front of the brain compared to the corpus callosum. Also, uh, white matter tracks, such as um, the corpus callosum is considered a white matter track, 
those tend to myelinate younger in life and like the first wave of myelination more towards like infancy and childhood whereas gray matter or the rest of the brain uh tend still has myelin but tends to uh, myelinate in that second wave during adolescence so these are uh, some potential reasons for the discrepancy between the corpus callosum and the cortex. It's also possible just technically that um, we're not able to see any differences of PLP uh, within the corpus callosum due to kind of, you know, looking in a forest for the loss of a few trees. Um, so uh, in conclusion, these experiments, uh, I think, have some meaningful implications. Uh, to enhance our knowledge just of how antiretrovirals affect um, oligodendrocyte maturation in uh, HIV negative population, uh, especially in adolescents, since they're in such a critical period of myelin development. Um, hope that these results can elucidate future therapies that could be combined with PrEP in order to minimize uh, white matter damage, particularly in adolescents, or um, you know, maybe eventually there could be a PrEP that's created that doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. Because I know for years and years, uh, there was a lot of effort to get these antiretrovirals into the CNS in populations that had HIV. Um, however, in the context of PrEP, there is no HIV. Uh, so PrEP really doesn't need to be in the CNS. So hopefully, um, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, I just you know can't say it enough that Antiretroviral therapy is great. Everyone should continue to take antiretroviral therapy, particularly PrEP. Can't, you know, advocate enough for it, but uh, we can also develop therapies or better antiretroviral drugs um, in order to minimize damage in these vulnerable populations. Uh, so with that, I just want to thank everyone in the Grinspan and Jordan Shooto Labs. Um, also thank my thesis committee, here at Penn uh, and overall the neuroscience graduate group. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take some questions. But yeah, we still have some time. I think, uh, okay, so. So Kayla, it looks like there's a couple questions in the, um in the chat. So Jonathan um, hmm. Geiger asked, um, did you look at possible deleterious effects of that um, of the non-acidic nanoparticles? And did you examine other acidification strategies? Yes. Um, so we did in fact examine other uh, acidification strategies in vitro. Um, in vivo, we only did the acidic nanoparticles um, and we used MLSA1, in vitro in our oligodendrocytes as this is a synthetic agonist for a channel on the lysosome membrane called TRIP-ML1. So if you activate this channel, it's a strategy in which um, one of the many channels uh, that you can actually reacidify the lysosomes. And we saw that that did in fact rescue oligodendrocyte differentiation in the context of PrEP. However, we are really interested in uh, isolating the effect of the pH on the lysosomes. So the pH of the lysosomes on oligodendrocyte differentiation, I mean. Uh, so we use these acidic nanoparticles as TRIP-ML1 has different functions. So we wanted uh, just to eliminate any other possible roles that TRIP-ML1 could be playing. Um, and as for possible deleterious effects, I'm also examining uh, the microglia and the astrocytes and just seeing what other uh, cells for the acidic nanoparticles. What's really cool is that um, the acidic nanoparticles are only acidic in the context of the lysosome. So at a pH of like seven or six even, they remain stable as PLGA. And then once they enter the lysosome, it's when they're hydrolyzed into their two acidic pro um, products. Um, okay, sorry, I realize now <laughs> I should have read those questions to everyone, but... Uh, so the, the next one, uh, are there any behavioral studies um, for like psychomotor uh, speed, working memory? Yeah, so I did not do any behavioral um, experiments. I would say, you know, if you like, you know, I was blinded and other, there were no obvious um, deficits of these animals, which is great. Um, you know, if these animals were really struggling, I'd, you know, be 
very concerned for PrEP. But the fact that, you know, it is really only having these minor effects, um, I think really has implications too of populations that could be vulnerable uh, to like head injuries um, or maybe are having drug use or something else that could be giving like another hit. And then in that case, you know, maybe we would see more severe um, behavioral deficits. Yeah, yeah, you know, PrEP is often taken for years, uh, particularly when people will be getting the long acting formulations. So I don't know if the animals model that duration of therapy. Do you have any thoughts about that? Did you look at different time points? Yeah, I know that's a great point. Um, initially, we only looked at this period um, and we would, you know, definitely interested in looking at it longer, even shorter, uh, as you mentioned, the long lasting injectables or looking at it in the two one one strategy, um, cause does giving a higher dose even on the short term make a difference? Um, I think there are a lot of questions we kept to this area, just really focusing on, um, oligodendrocyte maturation as it's happening the most here. Um, but yeah, I think that that's a really good point and it could definitely be modeled longer term. Um, it would be interesting to see if there are differences based on the route of PrEP administration. Yeah, um, so another comment that the pharmaceutical industry loves weak-based drugs. Does your work raise red flags for chronic use of weak-based drugs? Um, I think that it's definitely possible, especially if these drugs, so weak-based drugs um, historically are known to accumulate within lysosomes and remain there. So I think it does raise the question, especially if you're looking at a population such as the CNS where there's not a lot of turnover. So these oligodendrocytes for the most part are probably there your whole life. Um, even like neurons, there's not gonna be a lot of turnover. I think that, um, yeah, it definitely raises the question as to how much of the drug is getting there and remaining in these lysosomes. Um, and the oligodendrocyte is a cell that's particularly vulnerable to weak drugs across the board, I would, is my hypothesis, I should say, um, as the oligodendrocyte is, their uh, plasma membrane is about 70% lipids, and lipids are transported through the lysosome, whereas other cells are only about um, like 20% lipids, so the oligodendrocyte really has this heavy burden um, on the lysosome. Um, PrEP could be similarly affecting the Schwann cells in the PNS. Um, I imagine that that's definitely possible. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I don't do a ton of the PNS, but uh, they they should still be accumulating there. Schwann cells also need to have a plasma membrane that would have a lot of lipid in it as just like oligodendrocytes, they're wrapping around, they're gonna need that flexibility. Um, and yeah, I think just comes down to turnover in the lysosomes. And yeah, we'd have to look at that uh, more. Did I miss anybody's question? Or if anyone has a follow-up or more elaboration, uh, please let me know. I have a follow-up. That yep. was a great, long uh, series of studies and uh, real, you know, uh, very impressive. Thank you. Anybody else? If not, thank you so much for an amazing talk. Um, it's great to have you here. Uh, Cassidy, do you know who's speaking next week? Just to Yes, next week we have Robin Weissman and Aaron Shore are speaking. Um, Robin Weissman's topic is, um, let me just check, um, brain and acetyl aspartate, uh, NAG, sorry, I can't pronounce it, is positively associated with cognitive function in older virally suppressed people with HIV. And then Aaron's is um, to be announced and I should have his title soon. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for attending. Again, awesome talk. Uh, and we'll see everybody again next week. Thanks for having me and thanks for attending everyone. Yeah, really nice job, Kayla. Thank you.